remember last week what we started uh, was a series that we're kind of doing this two-part thing called fill in the blank talking about uh, it's just simply how we get started with things, how we stop things. And I just love that phrase, just stop it. Like, stop it. How many times in our lives do you just need to be told, stop it? Like, anybody have parents who just told them, knock it off? Like, anybody? None of you? Lydia's like, no, I'm the best kid ever. Like, no, no one ever, right? Well, I tell you, uh, last week when we started off, what we tried to unpack, begin to unpack, is this tension that we live in, where we have this, we have this thing where it's, our sinful nature desires certain things, and God's calling on our life calls us to different things. And so it puts us in this place of tension where we're just complicated creatures. We find ourselves caught up in that. There are things in our lives that we need to start, and there's things in our lives that we need to stop, and that's thus the video. And so I tell you, I've, I've watched that so many times, and I laugh at it every time. And some of you are like, I'm never meeting with Ben again. Um, uh, okay. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, our lives, I think a lot of our lives, we're at crossroads a lot of the time where we spend our time kind of like these points of intersection where the decisions we make, they're going to shape everything that happens after that. And what happens is we kind of have to choose a course of action. We have to commit to a course of action. It requires decisions of us. And so like we said last week, when what we start and what we stop, they go hand in hand. That if, if I want to start eating right, well, then I need to stop eating wrong, right? And so anything that you look at, when you think about starting in your life and stopping in your life, you're going to be able to see another side of it if you take the time to. And so that is what has brought about these, these two nights, last week and this week, where if we dig in on our pursuits, we dig in on these pathways that we're on, these passions that we have in our lives and these priorities, well, they change over time. The things that I cared about and that I set goals for when I was a kid are not the same things that I'm passionately pursuing with intentionality right now in this season of my life. And so with our experiences, change happens and in maturity in our lives, those priorities shift. And so the things we start and the things we stop change. We'll find ourselves beginning a new venture and a new chapter in our lives, a new season, or maybe new relationships or developing new habits. And those are good, but it also means some seasons need to come to an end. And sometimes the best thing for a relationship is for it to be over. And sometimes habits that have become so key in our lives, they just need to stop. They just need to stop. And we'll find ways to make excuses for this or that or whatever, but the reality is it just needs to stop. And so what happens in all of that is we find ourselves in that tension. And what we'll do is we'll start things and we'll stop things, and maybe it'll be for a season because we've not surrounded ourselves with the right steps. And so like we talked about last week, there's, there's a time for everything. There's times to fill in the blanks. And so as we learned... If you, before we just start filling in the blank with, oh, well, I need to do this or I need to stop doing that, we need to allow God to examine our hearts. We need to take the time to reflect, take the time to, to allow his word into our hearts, to internalize it, to see the things in us that don't fit, that see the things in us that don't belong, and begin to see it that way. And here's something I've just been wrestling with is this. Sometimes, Sometimes what we'll do is we'll examine and we'll identify and it'll just stop there. We'll know what's wrong. We just won't do anything about it. And I think what I keep coming back to is if we don't take the time to examine and we don't take the time to identify, we aren't prepared for whatever's next. But that isn't in and of itself what calls us to do something about it. A desire to fix a problem is not the solution to the problem. Right? Have you ever wanted to change something really bad? Anybody? Find yourself like, I want to change something. Is that what changed it? No. no I'm not saying there's anything wrong with intestinal fortitude. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just saying that that's not the solution to what we try and change. And so if we dig deep enough to get to the root, we can begin to see what really is going on. And so allowing God and his word to examine our hearts, the more we see, the more we identify and if we give him the room to move, I believe he does. And so we challenged everybody this last week to carve out some time to just reflect a bit. I know in our group last week, we were talking about how, how you spend time in reflection throughout the week if, or throughout a day. Like, do you spend time in reflection? And I know for a lot of us in our group, we're just kind of like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I reflect, which then it's kind of like, well, maybe I'm reflecting right now, right? But the challenge was to carve out some time and allow that silence 
to be something that you, that you engage, where God has the room to kind of speak to your heart, not just you rattle off the things that you'd love him to get done by the weekend. And so we posed some questions, one of which was, yes, what, what needs to start in your life? What needs to stop? What, what are some things that you maybe have already recognized because you feel the tension leaning in on you of like, this has to stop. I've got to stop feeding this beast. Or things that it's like, man, I, I've always wanted to see this happen in my life. Whatever it is. And asking yourself this question, is he my desire? God, I want you to be my desire. I want what you want with my life. Are those words true of my life? Are the steps that you're taking now leading you where you want to go or where he wants to go? And I think that to me, hopefully that, that gave you a window to kind of spend some time reflecting and wrestling with some stuff. But tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the now what, okay? So if we're going to examine and we're going to identify, the deeper we examine, the more we begin to identify, I think there's next steps for us. And I think it looks kind of like this. Commit and act. And so if you want to write those down, just to commit and to act. We're going to spend some time talking about that. Because here's the deal. I think that we can see things that need to change in our lives and still choose to do nothing about it. Anybody with me on that? Anybody have things in your life that you already can identify, that you recognize that needs to change? And you're like, I haven't done one thing about it, <laughs> right? Like, so that's the thing. It's like we can recognize something needs to change. Maybe somebody else will change it for me. No, that's not what's going to happen. Some of you are like, hey, I knocked out three finals today, right? They knocked out three finals today. Anybody get their finals finished up today? Anybody? And some of you are like, I don't want to think about tomorrow, right? <laughs> right? But we, we push things down the road. Like, we'll, we'll treat it like, oh, man, we'll just, I'll get to it tomorrow, or I'll get to it tomorrow, or come January, I'm gonna, that's when I'm going to start eating clean, because I, I just know that I don't have the willpower to make it through the holidays. And you won't have the willpower to make it through January, right? Or sometimes we'll say, like, I've already dealt with it, so I don't need to deal with it. And we all know that you haven't dealt with it. We avoid these points of tension because we want to avoid conflict for whatever reason. And so we will see things in our lives. And what we do is we say they've got to stop or they've got to start, but that's not what makes them move. So tonight what we're going to do is we're just going to give some attention to these ideas of commitment and action. So what does it mean to commit? Anybody? Anyway, this is your window. What does it mean to commit? This is not, we're not starting a relationship series right now. Just take a breath, all right? Just breathe. That's January, okay? Uh, what does it mean to commit to something? Pledge to pledge yourself. Sloan is back, dropping nuggets of wisdom right there. Yeah, to commit is to pledge yourself. It is to bind yourself to, a, to literally a specific course of action. That's what it means to commit to something to bind yourself to, to something specific, something certain, but it's a plan. It's a course of action. We commit to all kinds of things, don't we? Right? I mean, we commit to relationships. We commit to fraternities, sororities, organizations. We commit to churches. We, we commit to serving, right? We commit to um, obeying our parents. Why am everybody looking at me like that? You're like, never made that commitment. You're like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. We commit to a syllabus, whether you realize it or not, because whether it was you that paid for it or mom and dad that paid for it, like there's a commitment there. There's a relationship there, right? And still, no. You're like, no, no. My commitment was to survive this semester, and I have done so, right? <laughs> yeah, not all of you, right? Um, but here's the deal. When it comes to commitment, how do we know that commitment is actually happening? How do you know that commitment has actually happened? Follow through. What else? You see a change, right? When, when we, we go looking for something, we go looking for evidence, right? We want to see results. We want to see that something has actually changed. When we say that we're committed to something or someone says that they're committed to us, we want to see the evidence of that, right? None of us, none of us, even on our best day, when we want to believe that somebody's committed to something, are we just going to be like, yeah, they're probably committed? No, we're going to want to see tangible evidence. And so it brings about this word act. 
So if we're going to commit this, this pledge, this, this specific, certain course of action that we are binding ourselves to, it brings about the idea of act, of action. And so you can write that down, to just to take action, to simply say, like, I'm going to take steps to do something about whatever this thing is. It's to behave in a specific manner that's designed to accomplish that, right? Here's, here's a way to word it. Action is evidence of commitment. Action is evidence of commitment. I've, I've found myself, as, especially as a college minister, like I've, I've had the privilege of officiating dozens and dozens of weddings, okay? And it's always amazing. I love it. It's, it's beautiful, and it, it is an incredible thing to be a part of and to be able to, to serve couples and talk through some of the things that they're going to be walking through and what it, what it looks like to be married. But I'm telling you right now, I have, I have stood in front of a bunch of people and seen couples share words, these vows of commitment, and they're beautiful, and they're well-crafted, but they don't mean much minus the evidence. They won't matter much if there is not commitment and action reflecting that commitment. We can commit to things all day long, but if we don't act on those commitments, we aren't making much of anything. They're, they're, they become useless in so many ways. So maybe see it this way. To commit that's to give your word. But to act is to keep your word. There's a difference. Because sometimes we'll give our word to all kinds of stuff. That's why we talked about last week of like, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Because your word should be rooted in God's word. We have boundaries. We have limits. We've got to be able to discern the difference between no and not now. Now. And when we get pushed up against those limits, we've got to be able to discern the difference between competency and capacity. But if we undermine all of that, we miss all of that. So to commit is to give your word. To act is to keep your word. And we can examine and identify all the things that are off all day long. But if it doesn't lead to commitment and action, there's no growth. I'm going to read a verse to you really quick. A couple of verses in James. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, chapter 2. I want to read this to you real quick. Verse 14, and you probably are like, oh, I know where he's going with this. Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith can't save anyone. In verse 15, he says, suppose you see a brother or a sister who needs food or clothing, and you say, well, goodbye and God bless you. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? He says, so you see, it isn't enough to just have faith. faith. Faith that doesn't show itself by good deeds is no faith at all. It is dead and useless. And some may be like, well, you just jumped from, from commitment to, to faith. Well, well, what is faith? What's faith? I mean, it's a conviction, right? A faith is a, it's a, it's a conviction. It's, dare I say, a commitment to a belief. And what James is getting at is that, like, if there's no action tied to what you say, it doesn't mean much. I mean, how many times have you told someone, like, I'm going to pray for you? And you just meant that as a, I am done talking to you. Right? Some of you are like, no, I always pray for everyone. Right? <laughs> no, like, we will commit to things, and we don't follow through with things. And there's a gap there. So, Without action, it's useless. It won't grow you into maturity. To commit is to say you're going to do something. To act is to actually do something. And I think in the same way that if you, if you examine in a deeper way that the more you identify, I think in the same way, the stronger our commitment, the more faithful our action. The more faithful our action if we are rooted in a sense of commitment. But commitment's scary. Anybody scared of commitment? This is confession time, right? You know, some of you are like, totally. Some of you are like, I'm so scared of it, I'm not even going to admit it. Like, I like, because admitting it would be, well, committing to it, right, in front of all of us, right? Like, when we think about it, commitment, it, it is, it's scary. Because how many times have you seen things fall apart in your life because of the lack of commitment, whether in your own life or somebody else's, right? Let's just be honest here. How many times have you seen marriages fall apart because somebody didn't follow through with their word? How many times have you seen relationships completely tank 
because they said, this is what it's going to look like. And somebody chose to invite a third party into this couple. How many times have we seen a class project fail, a group project? Because there's always that guy, right? How many of you are that guy? Don't raise your hand. We already know who you are. No, I'm kidding. No, like, do you see what I'm getting at? Like, what we will do, what we will do is like, we will miss these things. And if we look closely, we will see all around us points of, of contention, points of conflict, points of failure. And it's because of either our lack of commitment or the lack on somebody else. I mean, think about how many friendships have had falling outs. How many, how many jobs have been lost because you committed to showing up and you didn't show up. It's tied together. I think it scares us away from commitment, but I think there's something that I want us to grab a hold of in this idea of commitment, and it's vulnerability. There's a difference between vulnerability and transparency. When we're transparent, it means people can just, they can see right through us, right? Like we're, we're, we're always testing things to see if they're authentic or not, right? To be not being transparent, it isn't bad, but here's the deal. When you're complaining, you're being transparent because all of us get a window into how ungrateful your heart is right? That's being transparent. That's not necessarily vulnerable. To be vulnerable is to say, I can be hurt. It's to put your arms out and to be exposed where you can take a shot to the ribs and you're not defending yourself. There's a difference. But that vulnerability, I think, will scare us off because it's not easy because it leaves us exposed. And it means means that we can get hurt. And none of us tend to get pumped about getting hurt. I think it means that we have to trust someone or something other than ourselves. But I also think, like, commitment sounds like responsibility, doesn't it? Anybody? I think (laughs) Keevan's like, yeah, it does, right? Like, responsibility sounds like work. And work sounds like, ah, let's do that tomorrow, right? Like, we, we tend to avoid those things because of the time it takes, the energy it takes, the work that it takes. Not only do you have to trust someone, You have to be worthy of their trust. You've got to be someone that they can trust. I mean, that's how, that's why so many relationships struggle, right? Like when there's, when there's no vulnerability, there's no trust. And when there's no trust, there's no commitment. And when there's no commitment, there is no relationship. And so commitment and action, they go hand in hand. We have to be able to not just look for that evidence. We have to see the evidence. And so what I want to do, I want to spend a little bit of time in, in, a, in a chapter in Colossians 3, in Paul's letter to the church there. And I'm going to just read some stuff here in a second that will hopefully kind of give us some tangible evidence um, of what we can see when we talk about these ideas of commitment and action. And so as I read this, I want you to just listen close. I'm going to be reading from the New Living, whatever translation you got. If you got it out, you can follow along with me or just close your eyes and listen. But start thinking of these words like stop and start and commit and act as I read this. I'm going to pick it up in verse 1 and just read some of the verses after that. It says this, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth, for you died when Christ died, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your real life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Verse 5, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual sin, impurity, lust, and shameful desires. Don't be greedy for the good things of this life, for that is idolatry. God's terrible anger will come upon those who do such things. You used to do them when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other. For you've stripped off your old evil nature and all its wicked deeds. In its place, you have clothed yourselves with a brand new nature that is continually being renewed as you learn more and more about Christ who created this new nature within you. If commitment is pledging yourself to a certain course of action and, and to make it 
then what we need to do is make it the right course of action. And I think what Paul is saying here is, there is a course of action. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Don't set your sights on simple things here on earth. Don't get caught up in the things that don't last. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. That's a course of action. You can hear it in his words. Why? Well, why is that the course of action to choose? Well, it's because you've been raised to new life. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to people who have chosen to commit their lives to Jesus, to choose him as the one who saves and the king that they follow. And so he's saying, you, you've been raised to new life. Your, your new life, it's hidden in Christ. It's hidden in Christ, that you have a brand new nature and that you, you're going to continually be renewed, that there's more and more to learn about Christ and that that's what you're doing. So let's just start there. The more you learn about Christ, the more you embrace your new nature. The more you learn about Christ, the more you embrace your new nature. I mean, think about it. The more you spend time with Christ, the more you will begin to love what he loves. And the things that hurt his heart will begin to hurt your heart. And you know what happens? You begin to act and you begin to do something about it. You see what he's getting at here? It sounds a lot like last week, in my opinion, that, that when our desires is for him, our new, our new nature tells that story. There should be evidence of our new nature. That should be evident in our life, that the more you grow in him, the more you trust in him, the more you set your sights on him, the more you focus on him, that what needs to stop in your life, what, we, what needs to start in your life, it becomes more and more evident to you and everyone else. It brings things to the surface. And Paul gives us a, a, a list of all these definite stops. Verse 5, he says, put to death. Translation, stop it, right? <laughs> he's, like, he's like, he's in a robe, and he's just like, oh, oh, right? Have nothing to do with. Stop it. Verse 7, you used to do this stuff when your life was still a part of this world. Stop it. And now, it's the time to get rid of, I love that phrase, it's the time to get rid of, fill in the blank. He rattles off all these things, the anger, the rage, the, the malicious talk, all the, the divisiveness, all these things, and he hits them hard. And he's calling them out to say, look, these are things that have no room in your life anymore because you have a new nature and some of you, you've heard me talk about this before because it's something near and dear to my heart, but it's simply this, with new nature comes new mission. When you've been given a new nature, you have a new calling on your life. You have a new course of action because who you were is not who you are because you've been given a new nature. And with that comes new responsibility, new work that you've been called to. When our lives are in Christ, who we were, is no longer a hold, have a hold on us. Who we are is new. Something must come to a stop so that some things can start. I think this is deeper. If you, if you just hear this as like behavior modification, you're missing it. This is not, okay, Ben just told us no sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Okay, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying, when Christ is your king, you follow because you're not fit to be king. What he's saying is when you choose, when you choose your new nature, there's no room for this in your life anymore because it doesn't fit. It doesn't belong. So don't make room for it. This is deeper than behavior modification. It's, it's more than just holy living. Holiness is rooted in new nature. And our commitment to holiness is rooted in a commitment to Christ. But I want to ask you, did you catch what he said in verse 10? Let me read this. In its place. Simply in its place. Three little words. In its place. And he rattles off, you, you've clothed yourselves with a brand new nature. In its place. And I'm struck by that because what needs to stop in your life says that there's, not only does it need to stop, it's what gives room for the things that need to start. So maybe ask yourself, 
What's in its place? What right now is monopolizing so much of me that there is not room in my life for the things that God wants in it? What are the things in my life that need to stop to give room for the things that need to start? Maybe see it this way. When we say, when we say no to the wrong things, you can say yes to the right things. But it's really hard to say yes to the right things if you're not willing to say no to the wrong things. Paul goes on to explain what goes in its place. I'm going to read some more, verse 12 and following. I love this part. It says, Since God chose you to be the holy people whom he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Doesn't that sound good? You must, you must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And the most important piece of clothing you must wear is love. Love is what binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the words of Christ in all their richness live in your hearts and make you wise. Use his words to teach and counsel each other. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, let it be as a representative of the Lord Jesus, as all the while giving thanks through him to God the Father. You've been given a new wardrobe because the old clothes don't fit. He says, start this. Start wearing these things. Start wearing tender-hearted mercy. Start wearing kindness. Start wearing humility. Start wearing gentleness. Start wearing patience. Clothe yourselves in these things. Start walking with one another. Start bearing with one another. Start forgiving one another. Start loving one another. That's what it looks like to sing a song in harmony with one another. Start these things in your life. That's what it looks like. Start doing this new nature alongside everyone else. Start being thankful. Start allowing God's word to settle on your hearts. Start singing him songs if you're not singing him songs. Start teaching others what you have been taught by him. And I love how in verse 17, it's the whatever you do or say, and that whatever, it's, it's, it's not the way we use whatever. We use whatever, like, yeah, whatevs, like, right? Like, hey, what do you want to eat? Whatevs. And then we actually care where you chose to eat, right? And like, oh, Taco Bell, I can't handle Taco Bell, right? Like, I mean, like we start rattling up, but, but we don't want to have a conflict. And so we're like, whatevs. But this whatever, this is an all-encompassing, all that you are whatever. And it says, whatever you do or whatever you say. So think of it this way. He's saying, give him your whatevers. Whatever you commit to with your words and whatever you act upon with your life, give them to him. And it takes you back to your desires. Who is your desire? What is your desire? When you say no to the wrong things, you have room in your life to say yes to the right things. In verse 15, this jumps out. It says, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Peace. Don't we want that? Don't you want that? But how do we have that when we're so complicated? We have so much going on inside of us that wants to do things like we talked about last week where, when the Romans 7 where Paul's like, I do not do the things that I want to do and all the things that I shouldn't do is what I find myself doing. And, I, and I'm, I'm so conflicted in all these things. Think about this tension. And I just want to say this. Peace only comes to your heart when the good king lives there. Peace only comes to the heart, your heart, when the good king lives there. Think of all the tension between what needs to stop and what needs to start. And uh, just flip over a little bit back to Galatians. I don't know how to talk about this without talking a little bit about Galatians 5, but we're not going to dive in it completely because I want to do a whole teaching series on it later. So I'm going to just read a little bit of this in chapter 5, verse 16. 
says this, Paul is again speaking to the church, and he says, so I advise, I advise you to live according to your new life in the Holy Spirit. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just opposite from what the Holy Spirit wants. Do you hear the tension in this? Like, this is what your sinful nature is calling you to do, but this is not what Holy Spirit wants you to do. He says, and the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite from what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, and your choices are never free from this conflict. Don't forget that. You will always live in the tension if you choose to follow Jesus. There is no easy street. You will always live in the tension. You will always. Your choices are never free from this conflict, but... When you are directed by the Holy Spirit, you are no longer subject to the law. That means this. It means when the Holy Spirit has your heart, things make sense. And he goes on and he rattles off in verse 19 and following like, here is what happens when you try to be king. And everything, the wheels come off. And he rattles off this list of like he mentioned in Colossians 3. These are the things that have got to go he comes back in verse 22 and says, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And here, there's no conflict. There's no conflict with the law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. If we're living now by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. <laughs> this is what it looks like to belong to Christ. This is what it looks like to, to act. This is what it looks like to commit. This is what new nature looks like. This is what it looks like to let, to let God fill in the blanks that to let him have all of your whatevers. It means letting the Holy Spirit into every part of your life. And so the question keeps coming back to this. What needs your commitment? Who needs your commitment? What demands your action right now? And some of us, we maybe know what it is. Some of us are like, I need to think about it some more. <laughs> some of us are like, there's a bunch of things on my list. Where do I start? What might God be exposing that doesn't belong anymore because you are wearing a whole new outfit? What might God be revealing as your next steps? Because I think it takes us back to Colossians 3. Because he says, do this alongside one another. This is the beautiful mess. You've, you've heard me say this. Some of you heard me say it a bunch of times. We are a collection of remarkably imperfect people fumbling through following Jesus, learning how to live in grace. This thing is a mess, his, his body, the church. But he calls it beautiful because he calls it his, okay? So if we're called to wear new clothes, if we're called to put on a new wardrobe, we do that alongside one another. It means this, it means that we examine, we identify, we, we commit and we act together. We do that alongside one another. And here's, here's the way we're going to wrap this up before we go into groups. On, on everybody's seats, if you saw it, there's just a simple action card. And it's simply this. It says, I want to stop blank, and I want to start blank. And here's what, here's what we're going to do. Maybe tonight, you already know. Maybe you're like, Ben, I don't know. I need more time. That's okay. I'm not going to ask you to fill it out and bring it up here and hand it to me. That's not what we're doing. What I'm going to say is this. When you head into groups, take it with you. When you leave tonight, maybe you need to take it with you. And don't let this be something you just stick in your Bible or stick in your journal or <clears throat> wad up and throw away or leave in your seat. Take it with you because my challenge is the same. The steps that you're taking now, are they leading you where you want to go or where God wants you to go? What needs to stop? What needs to start? Because here's the step. If you know what it is, let him fill in the blank. But the step that comes after that is doing that alongside somebody else. 
And I'm going to just say this, where we go, we go together, all right? And some of us, we got friends and we like, we know they are our friends. Some of us are like, I don't know if I can count on my friends right now. And that's okay. We're here and God's brought us here together for a reason. And so with these cards, what I'm going to ask you to do is this. Maybe, whether it's tonight or tomorrow or next week or next year, that you know what goes in these blanks, I'm going to challenge you. Find the friend that you know has your best interest at heart. Find the friend that you know loves you, that will stand in the trench, that will not just bust your chops, but will be your cheerleader, that will speak truth over you, that will not just be the ones that says, hey, hope it works out, but will be the one that stands with you and says, this is what I'm believing with you and for you, about you today, because you are a son and a daughter of the king. Find that friend and you share this card with them and you invite them into this thing we call accountability and say, this is what I'm going after. Will you hold me accountable to this? Will you walk through this with me? And some of us are like, man, I don't even know if those friends are in the room tonight and that's okay. Maybe it's your, your group leader. Maybe it's somebody that you just know you can trust. Make sure it's that person, okay? Take the card, fill in the blank, and share it with someone when you're ready. I'm going to pray we're going to groups. God, thank you so much for tonight. I know there's so much going on. There's so many of us that, like, whether it is papers that are due or finals that are tomorrow, or we have just been in finals all day today, and we are exhausted. Or maybe it's just been a crazy day at work with a lot of expectations. God, we thank you for tonight, and we thank you for what we can experience when we engage your word. Father, expose the things in us that don't belong. Help us see the definition of ourselves through your word as hidden in your son, Jesus. And God, we pray that you reveal in us where you want us to go and what you want to do with us. Father, we pray that the steps we take are where you want us to go. You are our desire. We love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.